so far beyond from where I should be. These walls still feel like someone put them there. I laid on Why are we here today? What happened 15 years ago? Oh, 15 years ago, I mean, we're on some pretty sacred grounds here. This is uh, Gunastado. Uh, 15 years, 15 years and four days, actually. April 20th was the day that uh, OPP raided the camp here at Gunastado, and you know, much similar to what happened on August 5th, they were uh, walked out by you know hundreds of people from Six Nations community that came out and made sure that uh, wouldn't have shown any lands were going to remain that way. Um, what are some of the similarities between uh, 2005 and 2020 or this year? Uh, and how does this action differ from uh, 15 years ago? <clears throat> um, you know, the, the action is exactly the same. And the inaction and absolute failure by the federal and provincial governments are exactly the same. And so I think for, you know, most of us at Landback, I mean, we've had this... Uh, roadmap laid out for us this time you know that uh, the the women that started this in 2006 uh, in, in April or February of 2006 you know kind of gave us the the path forward on how it is that we're supposed to do this and, and what it's gonna look like and so it it really it really made a world of difference to see the, the those women that uh, that led the charge for us in 2006 you know and see them really even today doing that same same work what's your connection with uh, 2006 oh well I you know I spent a year in a bush back here and in a tent and uh, seven months in jail for that and so I mean like uh, it was, this was a big part of my life in uh, 2006 do you expect that you'll be going back to jail um, as a result of 1492 I you know I I think I expected it going in for sure and like and now you know Nine months later, I, 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 it's still it's still a big expectation for all of us. I mean, it's, uh, it's this is the way that the government has chosen to deal with the peaceful occupation of our lands. How long have the land defenders and allies been here at 1492? Uh, since July 19th. This is uh, nine months and five days later. So I mean, it's been a, a long go and seen, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people come through and help and build things and you know bring material to build stuff like it, it has been an absolute gift so you kind of already answered this a little bit but uh, what's been happening at 1492 the last couple of weeks uh, the last couple of weeks is getting ready for winter you know, or getting ready for spring sorry getting ready to plant and you know building garden boxes you know continuing to finish off any of the construction stuff that we had going uh, making sure that we're able to you know rebuild the soil over there you know, yeah, the, so I, I saw your post about that, um, that uh, when, when you visit 1492, it just looks like the top of a mountain's just been chopped off and it's just, it's just dirt, it's not soil anymore. So are you guys, what are you going to do to change the way 1492 or, um, um, uh, not Meadowlands, um, uh, what, what Foxgate has done? Yeah, I mean, the bulldozers come in and they strip everything bare, you know, every, everything that makes our earth beautiful. You know, every blade of grass, every shrub, every tree gets stripped from the earth, and this is this is what's left. And so, uh, trying to you know do whatever we can to make sure that we're you know putting some of those that uh, those nutrients back in the ground with uh, very specific planting, and uh, they're doing some raised garden beds for for uh, vegetables. And so it's going to be it's going to be an amazing thing to be able to see all of that start to come together here in the next you know month or so. Um. This is a long question, I apologize. On the uh, 20th of April, the Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy Chiefs Council announced that they wanted to see a moratorium on development in the Haldeman Tract, an area covering roughly uh, just shy of 400,000 uh, hectares along Ontario's Grand River. Uh, Roger Silversmith of the Cayuga Snipe Chief said it's time to end the injustice and we want the land that is ours. We are not interested in approving fraudulent dispossessions of the past. Silversmith didn't provide clarification on how the moratorium would be enforced. Um, would you be able to clarify this for us? How would Six Nations halt construction along the most po uh, densely populated land in our country? 
Well, you know what? And I said that day, and there's 27,000 people at Six Nations. And, and for folks that think this is just me out here, there isn't. There's me and, you know, you know, a few hundred people that are that 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 do this. I'm just the spokesperson here and that was that that's been my role in all of this. Like I'm no leader of anything here. This is this has been a community effort from day one. And so like the to, to say that you know we're the only people that are that are willing to put our our lives our freedoms on the line to make sure that our uh, our land stay stay ours you know stay undeveloped to let uh, nature take its course in whatever whatever way nature wants that to go and so the uh, you know this the Grand River for all of us is a, it, it, this is sacred lands you know like this is this is part of who we are as Haudenosaunee people and and you know like uh, to disrespect our, our ancestors and the way that uh, to you know let these massive developments roll through, let the resource extraction, extraction continue on. Like like, what kind of disrespect would that show to my ancestors that you know gave their lives for this land? You know, like this was this this is part of you know what they fought for, and like far be it for me to let that go without without a fight myself. Uh, you touched on this a little bit, but I'm going to quote you uh, from the other day. Uh, you recently said that there are thousands of people living at Six Nations uh, and that uh, many more are anxious and willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that our land rights are upheld. Uh, are more actions expected at other development sites around Ontario, whether that's in Haldeman County or in other treaty areas? I mean, like we're not even talking about Ontario, we're talking about all across Canada here. And so this has been for you know the last few years here to see you know uh, the Wet'suwet'en folks out west and the Mi'kmaq out east up north you got the Kitigan Zibi folks at the Moose Moratorium like it, it is just uh, widespread the uh, the absolute failure that has come by the on, on, uh, from the federal and provincial governments across the country and so absolutely, I would expect uh, more people to continue to do the work that we're doing here, to continue to push in every direction we possibly can to make sure that our voices are heard in all of this. Because if we can, like, when we continue to lift each other's voices up and do everything that we possibly can to make sure that we're heard whenever these situations come up, it is absolutely imperative to be able to, you know, really see our rights upheld. Um, has the statement by the uh, Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy's Chief Council, has that caused um, more division or separation between the uh, hereditary chiefs and the elected band council? Uh, no, I don't think it has. I mean, um, I think the uh, band council feels the exact same way. They just, uh, for whatever reason, haven't come out and said it. You know, like the, there's the, the need for a moratorium on development certainly on the doorstep of our community that's going to you know further hem in our community like there, there's nobody at six nations that that is for development of our lands like i don't i i really don't understand what the what the uh slow process is to get uh the feds in the province down here to be able to deal with our community in a very real way a way that's going to see like some concrete decisions made so that we don't have to be doing this for nine months, you know. In February, uh, the OPP left uh, their their command post at the uh, Caledonia Center. Um, does this mean you guys have won? Is the OPP <laughs> still a threat? I mean, there's still a, a, a permanent injunction on the lands. There's still a permanent injunction on every road in Haldeman County. Are they come? Do you expect them to to repeat the actions of last year? You know, I don't, I don't know. You know, um, I think it would be quite foolhardy of me to say that I trust that the OPP isn't going to try and uphold one side of the law as opposed to the other. You know, then when our people have tried to push in the uh, in the courts then down here, and you know, like the Supreme Court says that whenever, whenever a claim is made to, to lands that are being developed, they need to, there needs to be a process of consultation that happens. And for us, that, that, that has some meaning for us. And so if you're not going to be coming to our community with real consultation, with real negotiation, looking for actual consent 
all of this while we're talking about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Like we need to be able to have a process moving forward that sees the rights of Indigenous people, not just here, but everywhere. Everywhere it needs to be a process that, that speaks to us, that speaks for us. Um, in March, uh, APTN National News, through an access to information request, uncovered that the OPP has spent over $16 million in policing this land dispute. What do you have, what are your thoughts about this, uh, this kind of money being wasted or yeah. used this way? I think it's absolutely ridiculous that, you know, 60 bucks in gas from Queens Park at $100 from Ottawa round trip to get here with gas. Like, like this, was, this was the cost nine months ago. This could have been the cost nine months ago in the middle of a pandemic that we're seeing, you know, businesses bankrupted and, you know, like, it, it is just absolutely ridiculous to me that here we are in the middle of all of that, spending $20 million because like, it's $90,000 a day and that's from January. So you know what, we're, we're probably up past $20 million now. And so for them to continue to just let slide $20 million, like indigenous communities, and ours is no different have boil water advisories across, like across the board. You know, the one community has said that they needed $7 million to be able to put uh, running clean, fresh water into every home. But instead we're spending that on policing a group of peaceful occupiers of their traditional lands. Like this is absolutely ridiculous and infuriating to so many. Um, some people that side with the police and or the land developer would say that this $16 million uh, was uh, money that did not need to be spent if you didn't break the law um, and trespass on private property. What would you say to those that might think this money could have been spent elsewhere? I mean, I think this idea of the rule of law is one that, uh, you know, the Supreme Court in this country has said over and over and over again that the rule of law, that policing in this country does not represent Indigenous people. You know, we are far more incarcerated than any other, than, than anybody else, you know, that the idea that we are just somehow more genetically apt to break the law is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, and some certainly, people unfortunately they think that, eh? They, and they, they, certainly when it comes to uh, land defense actions, this, it, it is absolutely ridiculous that we are criminalized to the nth degree. But then we got missing and murdered indigenous women across the country that have absolutely no recourse and, and for, for their missing and murdered, murdered women in our communities. Do you think the, um, that uh, those in the OPP chain of command uh, exploited this land action to basically redirect or funnel money back into the OPP? <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. Don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, don't really have much of an opinion about it, but I mean, like the idea that, these, these, uh, that the police have so much time and so much money that they can spend you know, this last nine months and $20 million on, you know, 20 people Honestly. sat in a field <laughs> singing Kumbaya around the fire, you know, like this is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, can we talk about the lawsuit? Sure. Okay. Uh, Foxgate, uh, Blantry Homes mm. and Losani Homes have filed a massive $200 million lawsuit mm -mm. over uh, 1492. No, I can't talk about that one. I thought the injunction is... Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, with the Six Nations Band Council agreeing to this development, the elected Band Council, do you feel that this is an uphill battle for you guys in court to challenge the development of this space? Absolutely, it's an uphill challenge. You know, and I think it's it, that's one that you know we've seen the absolute racism of these courts come up on you know October twenty second and October 9th that you know seen us you know, barred from participating in any kind of way that, that struck every bit of evidence that we tried to, tried to show the, uh, uh, the history of the lands here. And so for them to continue to push in this way that like uh, federal and provincial governments need to be, able to be uh, dealing with these third party developers. And, and like, th it is not our responsibility to be dragged through the courts by the by these uh, by these developers. Is there a disconnection between the Six Nation Band Council and the people of Six Nations? 
You know, I'd like to think not. Okay. But you know, like, depending on which family you, you come from, like, you know, uh, Six Nations Elected Council had, you know, just over 4% of the eligible voters in our community come out to vote last time. Why is there such a low turnout? Well, I mean, like, this is the, the coup that happened in 1924 that, that pushed our hereditary council out and installed the, um, in, installed the elected system. You know, these elections are not something that our people have ever, uh, ever wanted in our community. And so for, for that 4% that, that feel represented by that, you know what, absolutely, those are our people too. What is behind that low turnout though? Is it um, that the community <clears throat> doesn't necessarily trust the process? They don't trust the people running for office? Um, is it just such an unfamiliar system to how uh, you've done it for the last 600, 1,000 years? Is, is it, what is, what, why is it 4%? You know what, my, my mom and dad, they never voted. Did you vote? Nope, I never have. And you know, I, I, I hesitate to think that my mom and dad would probably disown me mm -hmm. for, uh, for voting in that system. And uh, you know, it's... Um, what, what, what would be, I, I know that the, the end, what would be best is to, to dissolve the elected band councils for, for many communities, many uh, indigenous communities. But what, what, is a, what is a more realistic short-term goal? How can we, we get a more representative government for the indigenous communities that, that don't necessarily believe in? Because I, I know there are a few communities that do like their elected systems. Most don't. Mm -hmm. But um, what is a short-term goal? How can we make sure that you're being represented fairly um, in the absence of, of anyone voting and having your, your voice heard? <clears throat> I know it's not an easy question. It's tough. For, for Six Nations, there needs, like, I'm no great philosopher that has governance at Six Nations figured out. I don't. And I mean, I don't, and anybody that says that they do, I like, uh, you know, I, I, I challenge you to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Because, like, governance here at Six Nations has been, you know, by government design, a divisive, contrary uh, stance on just about everything. Mm -hmm. And so the one unifying factor in all of that is our lands. And so when we... When we say, like for me, like I don't care which family or faction you come from, I really don't. Like everybody knows these are our lands and we all, not, not one person at Six Nations wants yeah, to see there, it develop. There seems to be a lot of unity in, in, amongst the Six Nations community, for sure. Um, you know, I've been coming here now for a number of months and I've, I've actually never really seen any real divisiveness. Um, but uh, it, it does seem to exist between the community and the elected band council. Um, no, nope, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I, you know, there, there, are, there certainly there is. You know, there's certainly people that would say that, you know, the Confederacy are wrong for doing this, that the elected band council are wrong for doing that, the uh, Mohawks are wrong for doing it this way, and, you know, like, and everybody's got their, their feeling about how, uh, how things should be. You know, but, but when, like I said, when it comes to lands, like, we all know it's our lands, and we're, there ain't one of us that don't feel connected to that land. Yeah, and I mean, like, this is, like, I, I, you know what, I got no blame for anybody for feeling any kind of way about whether or not they don't like the band or they don't like this group or that group or any, like, I, I, you know what, the government has played their cards very well over the last oh, 200 yeah. years yeah. to make sure that our community was as divided as possible. And this is something that, like, they've done in very documentable ways. And so we, now in 2021, to see it and live it every day, to see that those actions are still perpetu are, are being perpetuated by, uh, by the government, by the police. You know, like this is something that is, you know, it's absolutely disgusting to see it happen in real time. Yes. You know, this isn't something in a history book from 100 or 200 years ago. This is something that we see and live every day. Is there anything um, that prevents the hereditary chiefs from participating in, in the, uh, the elected uh, band council. Like I, I recognize that would be in a way dishonoring their hereditary positions, but would it be a solution in the short term to have, have their, their, like their hereditary positions recognized in an official capacity? I suppose it would if it wasn't against the law. 
Oh, is it? Okay, I'm sorry, I did not know that. Okay, that's the Indian Act, right? No, that's the Great Law. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, like obviously it's it's broad, but yeah, with with respect to participating, for example, in in a yeah, I mean like uh, participating in a foreign government. Okay, is ex- is, is is absolutely like is is something that you know our our people were not given that. Okay, and so we have a process for governing our people, and this is this the and and you know this is something that we live every day. I certainly didn't mean to uh, offend. You don't offend me. I I didn't worry about it. I I know that there's a lot of (laughs) ridiculous things still buried in the Indian Act. Absolutely. um, And uh, unfortunately, people think of them as artifacts, but they still apply uh, to to everyday lives uh, of people living in in communities all across Ontario and Canada. A a lot of people will see that, um, you know, you're you're the, the face of 1492 Landback Lane. What is behind the decision for you? Oh, there's a... What's the decision um, behind only you re- representing this, being the spokesperson for uh, land? Well, I mean, to be named in that injunction and to have that $20 million, uh, uh, $20 million hanging over my head from that damages that the developer is seeking, like, you know, this is, this is far more than just me. But at the same time, like, to be able to keep those people from you're uh, acting to protect them absolutely and so uh, you know I just got the nod this time and you know there will be somebody else next time and somebody else after that and so where, where is the the next time um, is where there, is there anything uh, is, is there an, a development in, in and around this area that you guys are equally concerned about I mean all the development up okay. and down the Grand River is something that I'm concerned about well, I mean, at this present moment, I'm a you're little focusing, bit busy. You're focusing I'm a little bit yeah. busy, so it's, uh, yeah, it, it's prevented me from being able to, to look elsewhere. Uh, what, what does the future look like for, uh, for you guys uh, at 1492, the immediate term? Immediate. You know, it, 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 every day it's just, you know, we're, we're cooking and cleaning and uh, cutting wood and, you know, building stuff, making sure our, our gardens are going are, are gonna to be fruitful and... You know, like it, 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 it's about about community and, and building that community there and making sure that everything that we're doing is is going forward in the best way that we possibly can. Awesome. Thank you so much. Of course. We are done.